Welcome to Prophecy Countdown. I'm Pastor Ken, and the title of my message today is number 389, From the Beginning, Male and Female. And we'll begin with the words of Jesus in chapter 19 in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, as the name of our podcast implies, all of our podcasts typically have a a prophecy thread, since more than 25% of the entire Bible uh, deals with prophecy. It's not unusual. Uh, as we open the scriptures and start to take a look at them, we will come across prophecy in the scriptures. Now, we love answering questions, particularly related to prophecy, but actually any question. I love to be able to get an email and give you a quick response. Our email address, address is prophecycountdownpodcast at gmail.com. Send us an email. Give us an idea about a, a question you have or maybe a, a topic for one of our up, upcoming updates. So let's go ahead and begin uh, to get in today's topic. Again, we are number, we're on number 389 from the beginning, male and female. So today we're going to be turning the page and getting into chapter 19 in the Gospel of Matthew. Now we're getting close to the actual end of the written account of Jesus' ministry, his earthly ministry on this earth. In this chapter, Jesus will leave Galilee, his home turf, and enter into the region of Judea. Uh, this is, of course, where Jerusalem and where the temple is. Now Jesus would not return to Galilee until after his resurrection. So let's go ahead and read these 12 verses in the Gospel of Matthew, and then we'll unpack what Jesus has to say to us today in the 21st century here in America. Now, um, so we're going to be begin at uh, verse number 1 in chapter 19. Now it came to pass, when Jesus had finished these sayings, that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea, beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes follow him, followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered, and said to them, Have you not read what he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate." They said to him, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her is a divorced, who is divorced, commits adultery. His disciples said to him, is such, If such is the case of a man with his wife, is it better not to marry? And, but Jesus said to them, All cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who have been bo born thus from their mother's womb. And there are eunuchs who are made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. So in these scriptures, Jesus arrives in Judea, and the Pharisees decide that they're going to test Jesus. You know, the Bible tells us that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were two divergent Jewish groups that were very antagonistic towards Jesus. Jesus typically ministered in Galilee. Uh, not Judea, in places like Nazareth and Caesarea Philippi and Cana of Galilee and Bethany and Capernaum. Because of the fierce opposition from the religious elite in Judea, Jesus typically stayed away. The Pharisees opposed Jesus for a, a number of reasons. One of the primary reasons was that Jesus was a threat. He was a threat to their authority. Jesus criticized their legalism, their hypocrisy. Jesus would emphasize compassion and the inability of the law to truly make people righteous. Now, the Pharisees knew that the people were embracing Jesus as the Messiah, but they thought they knew better. Just like today, people think they know better than Jesus, 
but they, like the Pharisees, are wrong. This passage today begins with Jesus healing the multitude. Today's scripture begins with the words that Jesus came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Now, most scholars will tell us that Jesus healed people for two reasons. One, of course, was his compassion for the multitude, but also, and just as importantly, to fulfill the prophecies related to the Messiah. Malachi, for example, the last book in the Old Testament, chapter 4, says, the son of righteousness, that's a term for the Messiah, shall arise with healing in his wings. Isaiah chapter 35 speaks of the Messiah and says, Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leak like, like, a, like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. These are all miracles that Jesus performed often. The Pharisees saw these signs and they needed to listen to Jesus. But instead of listening to Jesus, they decided he was a threat. And they decided to try to trap him, trap him by his words. So they asked him a question about marriage and divorce. You know, I find that interesting. As a pastor, I've likely had more conversations about, from members of my congregation, uh, about marriage and divorce than all the other topics combined. It was a controversial topic at the time, just as it is, as it continues to this day. They begin with this question. They say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus, as he likely does, as he always does, responds what the scriptures has to say. And he says, this is what the original intention of God in his creation. You know, my friends, this is where uh, there is so much confusion today. Quite frankly, so much deception today. Jesus said to them, and this is verse 4, he says, Have you not read what it was, what he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. You know, like many Bible teachers and, and pastors today, I have access at my fingertips to literally dozens of commentaries on the Bible, possibly as many as a hundred. Now, I didn't read them all, but I can tell you with absolute certainty that none of them, having been, uh, having been written in the last 20 years, had to defend these comments of Jesus that in the beginning he made them male and female. This is what it says. He who made them at the beginning made them male and female. Now, it's amazing to me how far we have come. Maybe you understand it as well, how much we have been deceived in such a short period of time. You know, just a, just a hundred years ago in the United States, the divorce rate was about 5%, likely not much different than ancient Judea, maybe even le less. Now, in the 1940s in, the America, in America, the divorce rate had grown to 28%, and it ended up going all the way up to 50%, in the 1980s. Now, official U.S. sources say that it's lower. It's actually gone down to the rate of divorce back 70 years ago. But before you start applauding, before you start patting yourself on the back, the reason the divorce rate is lower today than it was in the 1980s is because people are not even bothering to get married. My friends, this is the result of widespread deception. And that's exactly what Jesus said would happen in the last days. In the last days, just prior to his second coming. In fact, this is the very first thing that Jesus said. He said about the end times in his second coming. He said, be not deceived. But let's get back to what Jesus had to say about marriage. Jesus said that in the beginning, God created them male and female. Uh, just two genders. And Jesus doesn't even address in this passage sexual relations outside of marriage, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual. But let's go there anyway, as we're talking now about how we've been deceived. It was just nine years ago that the Supreme Court, by a one-vote majority, ruled that same-sex marriage was now legal nationwide. Nine years ago. 2015, it may not be politically correct anymore to say it, but this is just sin. People don't like to talk about sin, but pastors should because the Bible often talks about sin. There's a quote 
by a, a pastor, Pastor Mark Deaver, who is a senior pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington. And he says this, he says, sin once tolerated seeks to be accepted, and sin once accepted seeks, seeks to be celebrated. And I think we found that to be true. Same-sex marriage is no longer controversial. It is now celebrated. But let's go back to the scriptures and what Jesus said. He says, he who made them at the beginning made them male and female. Male and female, just these two genders. And the Bible says just these two. You know, there was no gender confusion back at the point of, of creation. God was not confused. After God created the first man, Adam, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper, helper for him. That's in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. So God's first objective in, in creating marriage and creating Eve was to provide companionship. Uh, but that wasn't the only objective. Jesus, in quoting Genesis chapter 1, is, is quoting Genesis chapter 1. So let me read chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. In 27 is the quote that Jesus says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. But the next verse 28 says this, it says, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful. What does that mean? Have babies. <laughs> Multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You know, the image of God is not Adam. The image of God is male and female, Adam and Eve together. Uh, God created male and female bodies to complement each other. That's why it says that they are to be come together and become one flesh. Any sexual, ex sexual expression outside of that what God created uh, to happen in marriage is, is sin. You know, since I brought it up that Jesus had what had Jesus had to say about end times and this widespread deception that was prophesied by Jesus to happen just prior to his return, did you know that all throughout the Old Testament, God uses this metaphor of marriage to illustrate his love and commitment towards the people of Israel. When the nation of Israel rebelled against him, for example, God expressed his sorrow and jealousy by describing a man who had been cheated on by his wife. And in the New Testament, Jesus uses a same, the same metaphor. He speaks of the church as his bride and he as the bridegroom. There were these are the metaphors that Jesus used and saying that he was going away to prepare a place for us. This is the metaphor of a bridegroom preparing a place in his father's house and then returning for his bride. You know, if we don't understand marriage, if we are deceived into thinking that we can celebrate a union between two same-sex individuals, or by two individuals that are confused and have dysfunctional genders, will miss the beautiful symbolism and the love that Jesus has for his church and the reason why Jesus is actually coming back for his church, for us. You know, when God designed marriage, the book of Genesis says that it was very good. God still pronounces it good when we follow his design. All perversions of his design, including divorce, sexual promiscuity, and homosexual activity, destroys families, and it actually weakens society. God is the designer of marriage, and Jesus, as the second person of the Godhead, is the only one qualified to give us appropriate instructions on how to follow his design for marriage. It wasn't the Pharisees back at the time of Jesus that was giving the advice, and it wasn't modern psychology today or the ladies of the view. My friends, Jesus is returning soon. This widespread deception related to divorce, same-sex marriage, and gender dysphoria that is so recent that we can remember like it was yesterday. Do you know why that is? It's because it was yesterday. All this deception regarding marriage, divorce, and genders is just one more sign that Jesus is returning soon. 
the Bible says, and I'll close with this, that when you see these signs, and these are signs, when you see this deception, and deception is a sign of the end times, when you see these signs, lift up your head because your redemption is near, very, very near. Let's go ahead and pray. So, Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for uh, what the words of Jesus, these words. Nearly every day, it's common to see, read, or hear something about the end of the world, the apocalypse, or end times. Author and pastor Kenneth Bear's The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom zooms in and breaks down biblical prophecy as it relates to Jesus' imminent return and the coming seven-year period, including the Great Tribulation. Available in both paperback and Kindle versions. Get your copy on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble and select Christian bookstores. The title again is The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom. You can also find it listed by author Kenneth Baer. Get your copy today. Thank you for joining us on Prophecy Countdown with Pastor Ken Baer. Don't leave without first sharing the latest episode with your friends. Be sure to join us again for the latest updates on Prophecy Countdown.